Hello everyone. Um, I'm very honored to be here today to tell you about my experiences of leading in a VUCA world. But before I will start, I would ask you to take out your mobile phone and to give me a reality check. Could you just scan the QR code? There is a questionnaire behind that. It's six questions, no right or false answers, but it gives me an overview of who you are, what you want to achieve in your life, and which topic I should concentrate on in my presentation. So please go for it. If you don't have a QR code, the link is written below. It's very long, but I think you can manage that. Great. While you're doing that, yeah, you all concentrate on working on that. That's good. <laughs> While you're doing that, um, I would like to tell you the four points of the agenda of this speech. The first is my CV as a role model. The second topic I would like to mention is VUCA, where does it come from, what is it? Then I would like to talk about agile software development and norms, and then we will come automatically to the topic of leadership, because that's there always. Okay, answers coming in, as I see. Okay. Probably, probably will need a bit longer. <laughs> That's good. So every one of you should get a QR code at the end. <laughs> about the questions. I especially like the one of the future me, so I'm interested about your future use. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see a green check, that's good. <laughs> Let's just go to the Firefox. To the result then, okay. Last chance, last seconds. Tick tack, tick tack. Here we are. Here we are. It's still as I expected the first result to be mostly women, but also at least six men who answered the questionnaire. I see more than this, but that's okay. Then about the age, 25 to 35, okay. Working companies, in huge companies, and most of you are working already. Not all as I hear. <laughs> My future me will lead. So a lot of you are going to lead or are already leading some others. So probably it's a topic that you're interested in. Um, Having children, yes, so I will take some time for that topic as well. And you know about HR software development, as I've um, expected. You know about Ask Mice, so that's our norms, you can say. And even the, the other topics are known. Yeah, but HR software de development is everywhere. That's good. Okay. I will start with my CV as a role model. Um, I only expected role models, or I only realized how important role models are when I saw them. I have been at Bosch, working at Bosch for seven years, and I um, got the offer to attend a training for 
senior managers. I was just a fresher as a senior manager by then. And I didn't expect anything happening there. And when I entered the room, I realized that there, there will be something happening there because it was a training only for female senior managers. And I entered the room and it was the first time that I could compare myself with others because I saw a version in that room, I saw a version of me that was stronger than I am. I saw a version of me that was weaker than I am. I saw a version of me that was more on the technical side than I am. And I saw a version of me that was more on the empathetic side than I am. And the funny thing was, I had always been with senior managers around me, but I never compared to them. Because I always thought, well, I would never say that. It would look strange or completely different if I would do that. So having role models is very important. And in that meeting, I also, in that training, I also realized what I liked about all the other women and what I didn't like. And I think both sides are equally important. You really need to reflect yourself on others and see what suits you, what fits to you, and what doesn't. So I am offering you today the way of how I live my work, uh, my life and my work. And I would ask you to challenge me and to reflect on me and to say afterwards or think about it, what you like and tell me what you like and think about what you don't like. <laughs> you needn't tell me that. So, <laughs> I started, oh no, I grew up in Austria. I studied technical mathematics in Austria at the Technical University in Graz. After my studies, I took some time off and went to Australia for four months, just enjoying life. And when I came home, I was really willing to work, and not only because all my savings were gone. So I applied for a job. And as some of you might have to apply for a job, I will tell you that story also. I applied for several jobs and I got several answers and they all were, no, we don't need you. You don't have the experience in that specific area my company is working on. And I thought, um, I'm applying for the first job after my studies, so yes, that's clear. I always work next to my studies. I even teach at the university, so I think I can learn that, whatever you need. But still it was no. And so I really vividly um, remember the situation. On a Saturday evening, I applied online, and that was not common back then, online for a job. On a Monday morning, I got a phone call asking me to come for an interview. And I took that chance, and I had the opportunity to show who I am, what I stand for, what I want to achieve, what I don't like, what I like, and I got the job. So I think that period is a period where some of you might go through, but it will end someday and you will find a position which you like. I started working at Bosch as a software developer and after two years I got the opportunity to become the team leader of the team I had previously been working in. And I realized in that change that I can do software and I can do the technical things, but I really love the opportunity and the chance and the, 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 the I love to create an environment where everyone can bring in his skills. And I really think that is a unique selling point of myself. And here I leave you all again. Think about what's your unique selling point. You should always have an answer on that question. And there is something which you can do best and which you like best and which you burn for. And you should focus on that. After two years, I changed position and got another team leader job in another um, team. 
That was more on the project management side. And during that period, a very important milestone of my private life was reached. I started a family. I got pregnant and I got married. And my husband and I had to think about the future plans of our family which we have. And we were both sure that we wanted to have two children. And hence we decided that we would split the maternity leave of our first child between the two of us. And I think that is what um, Sheryl Sandberg says when she's saying, don't leave before you leave. I planned my professional career as if I would not have the wish of a second child. And that was on the one side because my husband wanted to spend time with our child. But on the other side, it also took away the pressure of us of getting the second child very quick. So after the first child and the maternity protection, the eight weeks, I started working in part time. And then I changed the role with my husband, and he stayed at home. And as there are many men in here, he had a very good job before, and it wasn't easy for him. But I think that's the thing you need to go for, because it's really a good experience. And um, after the birth of our second child, I went to my boss and said, OK, I want to reduce the hours now. Now it's that time. And I would like to come back in full time by then. But if you have a very good job offer for me, you can call me by then. And almost on exactly that date, he called me and he had a great job offer for me. And a very interesting position, which I took. And I came back earlier in part time and then increased the hours again. So this was my private area. And since then, I have been working full time as a senior manager on several positions. And I am a mother. And having both is very fulfilling for me. But it's not easy, always. You have to have the ability to take a lot of decisions. You always have to reflect, what do I want to do? What do I have to do? And what are the things someone else can do? I just need to organize them. And then you have to organize them. And while doing both those jobs, I realized that you need to be very, very honest to yourself. You need to, have to, to be honest about what you are able to do and what is too much. And you have to be honest to your partner and discuss those points and find solutions together. And you have to be able to change decisions which you have already taken. But that's important for the professional life as well. So now you know about my private situation, but you might think, well, what are you doing? Yeah, didn't tell me anything about that. We'll get to that. I told you that I work at Bosch, so I would like to start with Robert Bosch. He funded the company more than 130 years ago. And one of the sentences that are um, very interesting about him is, what if magneto ignition is a flash in the pan, only a short success? How will I employ my stuff then? Well, it's 100 years, 130 years ago. A lot of things happened. The company got a worldwide player, a global player. The company um, is still working in a lot of areas. And still, the automotive sector is one of the main topics there. We have four business sectors, mobility solutions, industrial technology, energy and building technology, and consumer goods. And I'm quite sure you know the brand Bosch from some of your daily things you're doing. He was wondering whether the invention in the automotive sector 
would be a success, the invention that he had. And I can tell you, in, two, in 2016, still 60% of the total sales was in mobility solutions. So he needn't um, worry about that. And he worried about his three associates he had in the beginning. There are 390,000 associates all over the world working for Bosch now. So it's good that he worried about that, but he need not. I am working in the mobility solution area. I am working in the area of software development for engine control units for passenger cars. And the important things which we have to take care about is Okay. <laughs> um, which we have to take care about is the limited resources we have in this embedded system. We have to think about the robustness and the availability because you don't want to wonder why your car is not starting if it's minus 30 degrees outside. And you don't want to wonder why it's not starting if it's 60 degrees outside. It should just work. And one very important um, thing is as well the safety. You and I want our cars only to accelerate if we, or the driver, wants them to accelerate. So you might think this is a limited embedded system, but it's not anymore. We are talking nowadays about connected mobility. We are talking of components telling the driver when to go to the garage because they are going to break. We are talking about flashing over the air. We are talking about cars telling other cars where to find a parking slot. We are talking about the car activating the oven and the heating when you are driving home so that the cake is ready and it's cozy and warm once you reach that. So things are changing there. And I told you about safety and that only the driver should accelerate the car. Well, what are you doing with autonomous driving? There is no driver anymore. So all the systems there are changing. All the components are interacting with the Internet of Things. We are talking about sensor technologies, where the sensors are diagnosing themselves. We are talking about Industry 4.0, where the component is telling where it wants to be produced next and where the next step in the plant is for it. We are talking about the mobility solution and connected mobility. We are talking about smart homes, where the refrigerator is telling you what you need to buy. We are talking about smart cities. And we are talking about all those things interconnecting and interacting. And we are now trying to bring things into partners. We are now even talking about artificial intelligence at Bosch. We are talking about a home robot called Curie helping you in all the decisions you can take or you have to take nowadays. So do I think that world is volatile? Uncertain, definitely. Complex, getting complex more and more with every connecting item. Ambiguous, different goals um, on the same situation. Yes, it definitely is. So, what is VUCA? The four phrases I've already given. It's about volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. It was first used by the US Army once the Cold War was over. Because all of a sudden, you didn't know who's the enemy. You had to think about all those situations. And within the last years, it came into the leadership theories as a phrase for the world we are living in, as a phrase for the changes that are going on. So let me tell you something about ambiguity of my daily life. You have all said you know about um, HR, or a lot of you, not all, have voted that you know about HR software development. 
So you probably all know about the mes manifesto of HR software development, which will stand up and swear to it. <laughs> um, but it says that individuals and interaction go over process and tools. It says working software goes over comprehensive documentation. It says customer collaboration goes over contract negotiation. It says responding to change goes over following the plan. On the other side, in the software development where I am working in for the automotive sector, there are norms because you have to guarantee a high standard, a high quality, and you have to ensure that all the time. And there is one assessment model, the automotive spice model, which helps you improve. I just need to show, look. Okay. Sorry for that. But we have a different system here, so even that is volatile. Okay. The ASPICE model tells you that you should get the requirements from the customer very clear, document them. Break them down on your architecture. Break them further down on your software architecture until you have a detailed software design and then start the testing on the right hand side. Test against the detailed software design, test against the requirement, go to the integration test and go on testing. And you have to have all that documentation and you have to have them all linked together. So it is a lot of documentation you need to do there. It tells you to have a um, supplier monitoring, which means you need to have contracts with your supplier and you need to stick to them. It tells you to have a good project management and to stick to the plan. So do I think that those two worlds are ambiguous? Yes, definitely they are. And when we in the company um, looked on the spots where we could improve according to the ASPAIS model, I realized that the mood wasn't very good and the spirit wasn't very good and that not everyone said, yeah, let's do this, that's good. Um, and I started within my group, I started asking the people, well, if you are writing down the processes, if it's your decision, what would you improve? And then it was silence for a while. And all of a, a sudden, they started to find solutions for that. They came up with, with suggestions of how we could make the same thing, the same definition of done in the agile world, um, the same definition of done with an easier, quicker, uh, more interesting way. And I realized that all of a sudden, it turned out to become almost a sport to get better there. My job was to find the ones responsible for the processes and connect them with my um, associates so that they could interchange and talk about their suggestions from both sides. Sometimes we learned how the process was meant and how it should be done. And sometimes they learned about how to improve the process because they haven't done it 20 times a day. So it was really a win-win situation. And during that time, I heard about Daniel Pink. I heard about, okay, I will get to the next slide. I need help. <laughs> I heard about um, Daniel, Daniel H. Pink who has um, written a book about what motivates you. And there is a TED talk you can watch, it's about 10 minutes. And there is an animation on YouTube you can watch about the book, which is um, also 10 minutes. And he's mainly stating that um, external rewards do not motivate you. And I was thinking, well, it is motivating me if I get something, if I do a good job. So I was really wondering, what, what is he telling? Um, and I understand the logic very easily that if you do this, then you get this. And if you don't do that, then you get the stick. But that's just simple to do. 
And because I couldn't understand what he was saying, I was reading the book. And within the book, he had more examples for exactly that area. And um, I got that information out from there. And what he's stating is, external rewards may work if you're doing a manual job. But if your task is requiring creativity, then that doesn't help because that narrows your scope and if you need creativity, you need to, to look in all directions. And software development is definitely a task that is creative. And improving processes is a task that needs a lot of creativity. And so I really reflected that on my everyday life. And I thought about all the situations since then where I was not happy when I went home in the evening. And I realized that with every time I was not satisfied, one of the three things, autonomy, mastery, and purpose, was taken from me. So I really can say, I think that really works out. With autonomy, he means the urge to direct your own lives. With mastery, he means the desire to get better and better at something. You all might know this if you're learning a language or an instrument. And with purpose, he means the yearning to do what you do in the service of something larger than yourself that matters. And reflecting that on the, the example I've given to you previously, we had the autonomy, my associates had the autonomy to decide which topic they wanted to pick and to improve, because there were plenty of them. So they could choose the one they wanted. They had the drive for mastery, because we really wanted to improve the topic. And we knew the purpose, because we needed to get the definition of done. And we could either do it in an efficient way, or in a not efficient and not motivating way. So we decided the way on ourselves. And there was another change process going on during that time, where we wanted to have more transparency of the still open definitions of DUNS. And I was thinking, well, if, if it's about autonomy, mastery, and purpose, then everyone should understand that this is required. And it worked in the group where I am responsible, and it worked in the department where I am working, but it did not work all over the globe. And I was wondering how why? Why are they not seeing the need for that? And I read another book. It was Leading Change, Why Transformation Efforts Fail by John P. Cotter. And that was written approximately 10 years before the other book. And it's telling you what pitfalls there are if you're doing a transformational change. And it's giving you a process, an eight-step process, what you need to do to have a successful transformational change. And I read through it and thought, yes, I think they are thinking in that way. And I understood what they needed. And I realized by reading through those um, two different books and seeing the chronological um, side of those two books, I realized that not only the world is changing, the technology is changing, the internet is changing everything, but also, we are changing right now. The way we are motivated, the way we want to work, is changing. And that is very, very interesting. So, as per my understanding and per my interpretation, I would say, if you live in a drive world, in a world that is VUCA, that is agile, all those eight steps are given. Even the eight, but it's not there now. The first thing is establish a sense of urgency. If you want to improve and if you're driving for mastery, then it's clear that you need a change. Wherever you can get better, you need to get better. That's just how it is. Every second of your life. Forming a powerful guiding coalition. Well, if you let the people decide which topic they want to work on, they will come anyway. If they see that it's urgent, they are there. So give them the autonomy to decide, and that will work. Create a vision, a very important point. It's giving the purpose. Yeah? 
communicating the vision. It's again the purpose. Empowering others to act on the vision. Well, you need to do problem solving if you want to change something. Yes, that's, that's clear. Planning for and creating short-term wins. You need to celebrate success. That is very, very important because that is one of these rewards you get from external and they are for free. Uh, and it might only be, it might not be a, a big party or something, it might only be a high five or a look or a well done or just a, yeah. So there are several ways of giving that feedback and it's very important. And what's also very important is that if you make and count failure as a success, because you then know this way is not working, that's a very important information because you need to put your um, strengths to another way and find another solution for it. Then you have a lot of, of situations where you can celebrate the success. Consolidate improvements and produce still more change. That's still the aim for mastery. And in institutionalizing new approaches, that's the aim for mastery. You don't need to do anything additional if the mindset is there. Um, so, is there an answer to VUCA? I think it needs no answer. There is no need for an answer to VUCA because VUCA, that's our world. That's how it is. Everything is flowing. Everything is changing all times. But there is an answer. It's about vision, understanding, clarity, and agility. There it is. Um, and I think that's just what we all are living in and what we should live for because it makes a lot of fun. So, do I believe in a world that is changing, in a world that is challenging us, in a world that is not easy, but that is thrilling? I can tell you, yes, I believe. And do we learn something every day? Do we evolve every day? And there are my answers. Yes, we do. Thank you. <laughs>